Okay, my name is uh, my name is Bjorn, and I will uh, talk about <laughs> Fiddler. Fiddler, yes. Okay, and I will talk about Astro and Pledge, uh, OpenBSD Pledge. Um, yeah, here's a little overview. Um, uh, yeah, I'll briefly talk about Pledge, then talk a lot about Haskell, and then. Um, uh, I will explain sort of the, the Haskell specific bit that I've implemented um, and sort of the thinking behind it. And then I will show a code example. Huh. And that will probably easily get us to 45 minutes. Okay, so we, it's eight past, so uh, 50, I'll, I'll aim to end at 450 maybe or so. so People can ask questions. I mean, there are not that many people here anyway. But uh, all right. Uh, I hope this is legible. Uh, I can make it bigger. Uh, but otherwise, yeah. All right. So let's go. Um, so OpenBSD Pledge, if you've never seen it, uh, it's uh, part of the uh, kernel API. And uh, the idea is to restrict the uh, the accessible kernel API uh, that, that a process can use. Um, and the idea behind that is, of course, if you're implementing a, especially if you're implementing a long running service that is exposed to the network, um, then, I mean, obviously you want to write it in a way that it's sort of can't be taken over, but of course we, you know, we never know and someone might be able to inject code and, you know, take over your program. So we want to lock down uh, the things that they might possibly do, um, you know, as much as feasible, right? Um, so, or, you know, to flip it around sort of dually, we want to throw away all the, um, all the uh, uh, parts of the kernel API that we know we don't use. Uh, we want to sort of shut off access to that. So that can't be abused. Um, here's a little, I mean, silly example program um, where, so we, we see the pledge call, we see it has two parameters, um, two strings. Uh, we're not gonna talk about the second one. Um, um, the first one, it, it says uh, standard IO, which is um, sort of, is a group of, I mean, stands for a group of um, kernel API endpoints. Um, uh, yeah, such as reading and writing from standard output, standard input, um, getting the current time, I think. There's a bunch of things. Um, um, I'll have a peek at the man page maybe later to, uh, uh, to fill in a bit more details there. Okay, anyway, so we call pledge uh, with the standard IO promise. These, these uh, elements are called promises. And um, so after we call pledge, um, basically the only thing our, our the kernel will let us do is um, interact with input output and a few other things, um, which we use, of course, here to print printf hello. Um, then we do another pledge call, um, so they can be they can be uh, repeated, um, and this time we just pass nothing, right? We pass uh, no no keywords, um, so we throw. Th this means that we're throwing away all access to the to the kernel except for exit, right? So exit can always be called. Um, yes, so, but then in our program, we have another printf, and because we've actually sort of declared that we will not use anything else other than exit after this point, um, well, so this, this restriction is now enforced by just terminating our program, right? So um, if we were to run this, I mean, I wrote this here in the comment, the pro the, the, this process would be terminated before the second printf. That's sort of the idea. There are around 20 promises. Um, there is a, um, R path, there's W path, there's C path, B path. So these are for various um, operations on the file system. There's INET for uh, opening network sockets and a bunch more that are sort of very specific and probably have, you know, I mean, they have uses, but in sort of non-system level applications or, or sort of services that will probably not appear so often. Um, 
Okay. So that's just a little overview of the idea. I mean, there's probably people at this conference who are much more knowledgeable about this. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Um, Haskell. Uh, so that, that's sort of my, sort of, I, I know more about Haskell than OpenBSD or operating systems. So I'll talk a little bit <coughs> more extensively about that. Um, Haskell is a programming language, which you might have heard. Um, it's, uh, it's, yeah, roughly 30 years old, more or less. Um, so the ideas go back to the 80s and 90s. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so there were various uh, academic research uh, groups or individuals that had ideas about functional languages. And I mean, it turned out that they were sort of converging, and so they decided that they should actually, you know, uh, agree on a on a on a standard, <coughs> sort of a base that they could work on, and the result was Haskell. Um, the defining feature, of course, is this is functional. There's a little this there's a little bit of example code here just to give you an idea what this means, what it, what it means to be a functional language. Uh, in case you've never encountered this idea, so. The first important thing that, that happens in functional languages, or so let's start maybe at step zero, which is that everything is, a, is an expression, okay? Um, and the, what one way to form expressions is to do this thing called lambda abstraction, right? So because the ASCII uh, character set doesn't include uh, the Greek letter lambda, um, we have to use a backslash. Um, so that's what this, backslash x uh, is supposed to mean, it's supposed to be lambda x, right? And then we have an arrow, and then we have on the right-hand side of the arrow, we have another expression that has uh, a free variable in it, which is like, the free variable x in it. So we read this as um, binding, or sort of abstracting over x, okay? Um, and, okay, so we will see uh, in the next step or two, uh, second after next step, we will see what this means, what we can do with this. Um, the second example, so in the first example, uh, we have this idea of um, abstraction, okay? Um, and uh, in the second example, we have the, the idea of application, okay? So we have a term on the left that is, um, is in parentheses. We have a term on the right that is in square brackets. The square brackets are um, special notation for uh, lists. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, so that's sort of, you know, Haskellers like to talk about syntactic sugar. So that's sort of, um, you know, the surface language has some built-in things that make it nice to write, but they will ultimately be sort of unpacked into something more, you know, sort of uniform. You know. um, anyway, so the square brackets are notation for lists. On the left-hand side, we have, uh, we have, a term that is formed by binary composition, right? So the composition operator is the uh, is a dot here. Um, that's a valid operator name, um, and uh, and this is not a built-in. I mean, you this is just defined in a module somewhere, um, and it just stands for function composition, right? So revert, as you can easily imagine, um, is a function that reverts lists, and length. Uh, I mean, as the name says, it just computes the length of a list, right? Um, so, um, and composition happens from sort of right to left, right? So the revert function, so the, the idea is that the revert function happens first, and then the length ha happens after. Um, so you can read this as uh, length after revert, right? Okay, so. Uh, I mean, that's just one way to pronounce it. Um, the point here is that the dot, the operator, that's just a particular way to write function application, right? So an infix operator, it could also be written as a, as a prefix application, um, as, a, as a sort of application of the dot to two parameters, right? And in this case, the two parameters are length and revert. So what's happening here is that we're applying a function to two parameters, which are also functions, right? But more importantly, they're expressions. Um, and so that's sort of the core of functional programming is that we abstract and hence form functions, and then we apply functions to other 
to expressions, which can also be functions. And it's extremely useful, as we can see in this case, because we can just um, define an operator that uh, composes functions, right? I mean, okay, and then obviously this uh, parenthesized term is applied to the term on the right. The, the, the idea is obviously that we revert the list and compute the length. I mean, not a smart thing to do, but okay, I'm just uh, sort of trying to show, uh, you know, simple examples. Um, obviously, this could be written differently. Um, this could be written without the uh, composition operator, right? Um, but hey, okay, so we're just getting started. Um, um, the next really crucial bit is the, or well, um, I mean, it's for us, it's not so important for this, for this discussion, but um, one of the sort of core features of, of Haskell and, and sort of the main impetus behind its development was um, the idea of lazy evaluation, hence this law, right? You can see this law. <laughs> um, so lazy, so, that, so the, the Haskell sort of really sort of crystallized around the idea of lazy evaluation and, um, and a particular kind of type system, right? Those are the core ideas. Um, lazy evaluation, just to illustrate it here. Um, so on the left-hand side, we have this uh, parenthesized term, which is a lambda abstraction, just like in the first example. On the right-hand side, we have another parenthesized term, which is, well, I mean, it's uh, the application of this binary operator to two constants. Now, um, you know, so if you were given this thing and, you know, you were asked to say what this is, um, or sort of what it, you know, what the result is, what, what it, uh, you know, what it computes, um, there are sort of two ways you could go about this, right? You could, you could, you could first, you know, calculate 2 plus 2, which is 4, which is a new constant. Then you unwind this application of, you know, the, the parenthesized term on the left, the lambda abstraction to this new constant, 4. Um, and obviously, yeah, the point of application is, of course, that uh, the parameter gets put into in the place of the variable, right? So in this case, 4 would be put into place of the x in the expression that we have exp abstracted over. So we would end up with 4 times 4, which, again, we can evaluate. Um, now that's the sort of that's what's called the strict evaluation order. Um, oh, sorry, it is yes, that is strict evaluation. Um, what Haskell does is um, sort of is different. It will actually happily um, substitute the two plus two into the x, right? For, so, but then we get a term that says two plus two multiplied two plus two with the parentheses that I'm not pronouncing. Um, and then we can go from there, right? Because, okay, so we, there's some more primitive operations that execute the arithmetic on the, on the CPU. Um, now, that seems wasteful, right? Um, but there's another aspect, which is called uh, sharing. So, in fact, um, we're not sort of syntactically substituting, but we're actually just forwarding a reference, right? So the, the 2 plus 2 actually only exists once in memory. Um, so when we have this expression, 2 plus 2 times 2 plus 2, then when we go about evaluating this, we evaluate 2 plus 2, but that's actually a reference to the term itself. So then when we evaluate that, we have actually already evaluated the second occurrence of 2 plus 2 as well, right? So this is called lazy evaluation with, with sharing, right? Um, or call by need is sort of the technical term for this. Um, now this gets, you, know, you might wonder why. Um, so the, the, the ide basic idea is that um, by being lazy, um, we can, um, we can sometimes save work, right? So uh, it might turn out that, so on the left-hand side, we might have some much more complicated function. And in some cases, you know, depending on some other parameters, uh, we may not actually need this value that we're passing in, right? So we may never need to evaluate the, 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 this expression, 2 plus 2, right? Then we could just forget about it. Or let's say, well, it will eventually be forgotten, right? Um, anyway, the point is that laziness can sometimes save work. 
and um, and it also makes it much nicer actually to in a lot of situations it makes it nicer to think about um, code refactorings anyway um, that's not really the focus here um, but just to sort of provide some context um, the Haskell is also pure um, it's a bit difficult to sort of give a really precise definition but the idea is that we we try well first of all we avoid mutation at you know, not at all costs but mostly we do not want mutation also we want functions that always evaluate so given the same arguments always evaluate to the same result meaning it, well th and the important th th the important reason why we want that in a lazily evaluated language is that it doesn't matter when we evaluate, for example, right? Because our function has no side effects. And we can also freely share, right? We don't need to worry that sort of side effects happen, you know, some unexpected number of times or in some, you know, at some unexpected point in time because they, they are sort of excluded. Mm. So all these functions that I've, all these examples that I've given, they are pure expressions, right? So evaluating them does, has no side effect. I mean, for you know, a reasonable definition of side effect. Anyway, um, and all this is pretty tightly uh, intertwined actually with, with the type system, right? Um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail on that now, or actually none at all, and uh, we will see in later examples, I will explain the, to the necessary extent. Okay. Um, okay, so that was Haskell, the language. Um, at the time, there were a bunch of projects that were um, sort of implementing. So th these people that I was talking about that sort of came, got together and you know, decided that they should collaborate, um, they actually wrote a, a language uh, standard. It's not a formal specification, but it's, um, you know, it, it defines uh, standard functions that should exist, what type signatures they should have, um, and a, a bunch of other things. Um, and there were several different uh, implementations of this, uh, of these ideas, of this, of this language standard. Um, but so nowadays, um, GHC, which is the Glasgow Haskell compiler, exists in OpenBSD ports. Um, latest version, I believe, is 9.2.8. Um, it's basically the only game in town. Um, and it's sort of, it's really a sort of industrial strength um, sort of uh, product, right? I mean, it's, uh, I use it at, in, my, in my work and um, yeah, so our whole uh, company basically relies, as I thought, our entire web service backend is written in this and it's a, you know, it's a legal tech um, context. So we, you know, we have to so have pretty high confidence in this stuff. Um, I mean, it's not, you know, obviously not a hugely popular language, but I mean, it does have uh, um, serious uh, users, uh, committed users. <laughs> All right, so GHC in particular, yeah, like I mentioned, is a de facto standard compiler. It generates native code for various uh, common platforms. Um, uh, it actually can do this in different ways. It can do it via, via C, it can do it via uh, LLVM, it also has its own native com native code generation backends. It can, there's um, this sort of pre-release uh, work for WebAssembly and also JavaScript targets actually. Uh, it's been a long time coming, but uh, uh, I think it's, al it's already sort of in an alpha, alpha stage, it's already available. Um, GHC also comes with a REPL. Uh, which is sometimes extremely handy. Um, and also it comes with its own runtime system, right? Because there's a lot of things that you need to do in the background to actually make all this stuff work. Um, one of which is this M2N uh, multi-threading. So um, that's pretty nice. Um, the runtime system also provides uh, uh, various um, synchronization primitives uh, for, for threads. Um, among which is uh, software transactional memory, which is, um, you know, if you want to be you know, very tidy about uh, thread interactions, that's a, that's a very nice thing to have. And um, yeah, so lazy 
evaluation basically necessitates a garbage collector um, because we really want to, well, first of all, we don't, uh, we want to abstract away from, you know, the when our expressions are evaluated, how often they're evaluated, and, um, and, and evaluating the expression. I mean, it changes the memory representation, right? So we, we abstract all of that away. Um, so we definitely need a garbage collector. Um, yeah, uh, it actually employs several strategies. There's also preliminary work on a multi-threaded one. Anyway, so it's it's pretty it's pretty sophisticated and it's it's a very very active development um, on that front as well. Okay, um, so then around the compiler we have um, Hackage, which is sort of the basically the only relevant um, package rep repository. Um, there's a thing called Hugo. Uh, yeah, I mean, okay, so some the naming is a bit uh, humorous at times, which is a search engine. Basically, it indexes the entire Hackage um, repository. And uh, there's a build tool, um, Cabal, which also uh, is, is a package manager and obviously draw, I mean, it, the main source for packages is obviously the, the package repo, Hackage, which I already mentioned. There's also an implementation of the language server protocol, um, which is, I believe is a Microsoft invention f originally for VS Code, but um, but uh, yeah, I mean many uh, many editors now support it, including Emacs and Vim, I guess. Uh, I don't know what else people use. Um, so anyway, there's a there's an implementation called the Haskell language server, which um, yeah, I mean it's a sophisticated wrapper around the compiler. Right, um, so the point is that it reuses the compiler, the GHC itself, um, as its sort of core. Um, okay. All right. Okay. So let's do some hello world. <laughs> so this is what uh, very simple. I mean, it's not the simplest, but but a sort of moderately simple uh, Haskell program would look like. The compilation units are called modules. Uh, I mean, they're congress with files. Um, the compiler will enforce the concordance of names. So, for example, this this module called main it has to be in a file called main.hs. Um, we import uh, something from another module. Um, there's a hierarchical namespace for for modules. Um, we can we can selectively import. So we're importing here um, a function called append file from this module, obviously. Um, we define a function main, um, and it does a bunch of things. The uh, uh, thing to note here is that we say main, and then we give its type, and uh, uh, sort of the, the notation for that is this double colon. On the right-hand side, we have the type, and it says IO of, um, yeah, nothing, I guess, or I don't actually know what the standard pronunciation for this is. I mean, it's supposed to be a, supposed to denote an empty tuple, I guess. Um, so, okay, anyway, it's it's IO applied to empty tuple, right? That's the type of the main function. And I'll, I'll say a little bit about more later about what this means. Um, so we have the type um, declaration, and then we define the term, right? So main is this. Um, we have a do block. So do introduces a sequence of actions, right? So this is a way of writing imperative code in Haskell. And um, there's a function called put string line, obviously, which does the, uh, the usual, I mean, what, it, what you expect. Um, we fetch some input, bind it to a name, um, then we append this, you know, the contents of that uh, to a named file, names.txt. Um, and uh, okay, so we apply a function to this name, which defined up here, um, yeah, with this type signature, which is I mean tells us that it's obviously a function from string to string. We print the result. Okay, uh, yeah, I mean it's I hope it's not too uh, jarring. I mean if you're not familiar with this, I think this should be sort of reasonably understandable. Mm. Yeah, so 
the thing to note is that uh, Haskell relies a lot on indentation. So you could use curly braces to delimit, for example, this do block. Um, it's usually not done. Um, we could leave off the type definition, the, the type declaration, because, um, and sort of in early Haskell, that there was a lot of code that people wrote basically showing off, hey, we can do type inference. So we don't actually need to write the types. The compiler will infer them for us um, and check them, right, obviously. Um, but now, I mean, it's, I mean, in, yeah, in serious applications, it's frowned upon, obviously, to, um, to not have top-level definitions with uh, declared types. And the compiler will warn about it nowadays, which you can turn off, but anyway. All right, that's uh, that, uh, suffice to just get to know the language a little bit. Um, now, obviously, we want to talk about uh, pledge, right? So what, what do we, how do we sort of um, enhance this program? Um, uh, so let's, you know, so we should analyze this somehow. Um, if we look at the man page, so if we were to look at the man page um, and think about sort of the implementation of these functions, the put string line, the uh, append file, the get line, um, I mean, they ultimately call, um, you know, uh, stuff in libc, you know, open at the uh, put string and so on, right? Um, uh, yeah, so if we, you know, analyze this carefully enough, uh, we come up with with these promises that are needed, right? So put string line writes to standard out, and the promise that allows that is called standard IO. Append file um, needs to open and possibly create a file in the file system that requires the, the wpath promise. It also needs to write to that file that requires the standard IO promise. Get line reads from standard input, and you can read the rest here. Okay. Um, that's sort of straightforward enough. Uh, okay, so now how do we do this the Haskell way? Um, huh. That's not a comment, that's actually, okay. <laughs> uh, right, so, so now we're getting to the stuff that um, where I implemented, uh, that I implemented to, to actually uh, call pledge from Haskell in a, you know, smart way. Um, the low level um, bit is um, this function pledge, which goes from set of promise to IO of uh, nothing. Um, I mean, it has underneath the FFI binding. Um, we do some marshalling there where we serialize um, uh, some constants. We, we print out the, the text constants and concatenate them. Um, so the way, um, this, yeah, so I mean, it's, I, I imagine I have, I have I'm, not, I'm not totally certain about this, but I imagine that this was for, for user, for usability, that the OpenBSD BSD pledge um, API, it just uses a, a, a space separated string of these keywords, right? I mean, it's incredibly easy to write to, to use, right? If you were, if, if you're writing a C program and you need to apply this, right? Um, Okay, so yeah, we, so this pledge function here, it does that sort of under the hood. Um, now, because we work in Haskell, um, you know, we don't wanna, I mean, we could use strings, but um, we want to be more precise, right? And the way to do that is to use a data type, which is, um, so in Haskell, data introduces uh, an algebraic data type, which we're defining here. The data type is called promise and it has these constructors. Um, and I counted them once, I think there are about 20 of them. Um, now this is essentially an enum, right? Um, during runtime, these will be represented by machine words, by, by, by one machine word each. Um, okay, and then, well, so this deriving means, okay, we, we're basically asking the compiler, please generate some boilerplate stuff for us. So show is a way, so the compiler will will define a canonical way to print these things by just converting the the uh, the names 
into strings, right? So it gives us a way to print them. Print them. Ack gives us a way to compare them. Enum allows us to enumerate them. Ort does um, ordering comparison. Uh, the order is obviously just the, the one that is enumerated here. I mean, this is so. This is stuff is sometimes useful and sort of a habit to to define them uh, for most types. And it's free. So um, I mean, free in the sense that there's only one line of code. Um, and uh, yeah, okay. So there's the pledge man page, obviously, that explains what all these things actually mean, right? Um, all right. Okay, so now uh, we take our example program and we, we're gonna sort of enhance it um, with pledge. And, uh, oh, remember, um, the uh, type signature here told us that we need to pass in a set of promises, right? Um, I could have used lists, but um, set is a, bit, a little bit nicer because this will make sure that um, when we process it, the keys are all uh, unique and sorted. Right? Oh yeah, by the way, that requires the, this thing, right? The ought, um, uh, oh, this ordering, sort of canonical ordering. Um, okay, um, yeah, so these are the, the promises that we uh, thought about, that, uh, that we figured out we need to use. And um, okay, so we insert a pledge call, you know, before everything, after everything, and then in between all the sort of application actions. Why not, right? I mean, it's the sort of, I mean, it's, it's potentially wasteful, but, uh, you know, to keep it simple. Um, and in the end, we want to end with no promises. So we create a set from an empty list, so that gives us an empty set. Um, and then we'll run pledge on an empty set, so that will ultimately call this pledge function, the C function that I showed in the beginning with, with an empty string as the first parameter, and that will discard all, all promises and leave us only with the exit call. Um, so then the question is, okay, put string line requires the standard IO promise, so okay, so we should probably put that here, right? So where this underscore is, which by the way is valid Haskell notation. Um, uh, in this case, the compiler would tell us there's a, there's a, there's a hole here, there's a technical term, is a hole, um, which you need to fill, and it needs to have this type, um, which is extremely handy, uh, especially when you're using Haskell language server because then you actually the, uh, your editor would tell you, when you move the cursor there, it'll tell you how to fill this hole. Um, and uh, okay, so we should, uh, we need to put the standard IO here. Now our pen file needs both of these. So obviously we would put, you know, from list, both of these elements here. When we go one line up further, um, uh -huh. So now this gets a little bit, so this is where it sort of um, becomes more trivial because get line requires standard IO, but later in the program, we already know that we need W path. So in this pledge call, we also need to um, include the W path, right? And so on, and then the same for the, for the first call. Um, so like this. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty clear. Okay, now for something completely different. What is actually happening here, right? So this is a do block. Haskell is supposed to be a functional language. Why do we have imperative code? How is that, I mean, isn't that strange? Well, um, the solution is that underneath it is actually functional. Mm. I wrote here in comments, I wrote the uh, type signatures, right? So get line. Is, a, is an action with this type being IO of string. Um, and that's supposed to tell us that, um, well, it's an action that yields a string, right? That's, that's what this means. Um, put string line is uh, obviously a function that consumes a string and returns an action, um, IO of nothing. So that's an action that has a side effect can have a side effect, uh, but doesn't yield any value, right? Um, so technically it yields a value, but it's a unique value that 
doesn't carry an inf any information, right? That's the idea. Mm. But, um, so people say that this notation, this do block, do, and then line after line of imperative code is sugar, right? Meaning uh, it's sort of icing on top of, you know, the language. Um, and GHC, or I mean, any Haskell compiler, um, um, will actually turn this into this expression that we find down here, um, which is uh, an application of a binary operator to a to an action to this action get line action, um, and as a second parameter, this lambda abstraction. So it'll literally do this expansion. Um, now, obviously, this can be reduced, right? So. If we wanted to optimize this, we would we would eliminate this variable, right? Because um, having an application of a variable and then abstracting over the same variable, sort of one level up syntactically, uh, we can just eliminate the abstraction and the application, right? That's a it's called the alpha rule. Oh, sorry, not the alpha rule. It's called the eta rule. Um, okay, but regardless. Um, the thing here could be something more complicated, right? Where we can't just eliminate it. Um, so this expression where sort of the second line of the imperative program here could be some more complicated expression. Mm. So hence this syntactic expansion um, with the lambda. Okay, so point being imperative code gets converted into functional code, right? Now, this is allowed because, um, or let's say, um, this requires that um, the types match, right? Uh, what do we have? Yes, okay, so um, we have this application of this operator, which is, by the way, is called bind. Um, and I suppose these arrows and the equal sign is supposed to suggest, you know, stuff coming out of the first expression and being sort of fast forwarded into the second expression. I think that's the idea, visually. Um, but it's a binary operator, right? So that's really nothing more than a binary function. And um, oh, we haven't actually seen fu um, functions with uh, this kind of arity, but this is how it's written. Um, note that arrows associate to the right, right? So the first parameter is IO of A. The second parameter is a function from A to IO of B. And then the result after that is IO of B. Now I said um, arrows associate to the right, right? So that actually means that, um, that actually means that all functions are unary, right? <laughs> which sounds weird and limiting, but it's actually not because, um, of course, the return type can be a function type, right? Which then we can apply more arguments to. So this is perfectly fine. And it's actually incredibly handy. Um, um, yeah, so that's what's going on here. Um, right, so this is the bind operator. Um, and uh, so there is a particular implementation of this bind operator for this type IO. Mm -hmm. um, note that we have, I hadn't actually mentioned this before. <coughs> this, is a, this is a really important aspect actually of the type system is something called polymorphism. Mm. And uh, in particular, parametric polymorphism, right? So these lowercase letters here in the um, in the type signature, they are variables, um, which means that we can implement this. So there is an implementation of this operator where we know nothing about the types A and B, right? But the type signature um, prescribes that whatever we, we return here in the end has to be of the type I O of B, right? And this also has to match, right? So the the first expression that goes into the bind operator has to be, if it is I O of A, then the first parameter 
<coughs> of this uh, of the second argument has to be of the same type, right? So that's that's very neat, and um, I mean this keeps things very tidy. Um, okay. Uh, now, that's not enough, though, right? So I've talked about imperative programs and how they are actually sequences of um, binds, right, underneath, so they're, it's functional. Um, now we want to, uh, right, so I didn't, I didn't, I didn't show, uh -huh. uh, okay, so, so if we look at this program, obviously there are more lines, there's, so it's four lines, not just two, and um, they will be expanded in this pattern from top to bottom. Um, so this will be sort of um, left associated with this bind operator, right? Um, and now sort of the, the thing that we really want to do is we want to use the Haskell type system to compute um, stuff for us. Uh, so to compute the, uh, the, the promises for us that, that are required in this imperative sequence. And we do that by wrapping our um, side affecting actions in this, yeah, slightly scary looking gadget, which is called a new type. Um, and that's basically a way of attaching more information, more type information to an existing, to a value of an existing type. Um, and the important bit is that um, it will have the same runtime representation, right? So this doesn't create any any new pointers, for example, right? And it doesn't require any 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 extra allocation. Um, but it will allow us to attach information here that uh, that the type that the compiler that during type inference will ha will will work with, right? Um, okay, so we'll ha I'll have to say a few things about what these things are that that are listed here. So, okay, so we're defining a new type, okay, that's the keywords, We'd, and the new type is called pledge. It has three parameters. The first parameter is Zs, which is of this kind. It has another parameter called Ps, which is of this kind. And then it has a third parameter, which is called A, which is an, an ordinary type, okay, which then uh, is relevant for the stuff that's actually inside that we're labeling, right? Okay, um, so uh, yeah. So let me let me explain what this awkward stuff is that that uh, I was just uh, talking about. So there's something called um, data pr data promotion, um, and uh, so GHC implements an extension to the language to the Haskell language standard called data kinds, and that means that um, Every type constructor now also stands for a type. Okay, so um, I've listed the so the, the sort of relevant examples that that, that are uh, pertinent here in, in our example, in, in in our situation. So I showed you earlier the definition of the promise data type, right? So in particular, it has this uh, this term, right? There's this term called standard IO, it's a constructor of the promise type. Um, and so that's what this first line means, right? So double colon means the thing on the left has the type on the right. Um, now the second line means promise. Oh, okay, promise is a type, right? It's on the left. On the right-hand side it says star. Okay, so this means that promise is a type of kind star. Um, which is sort of the universe of all types that contain values, right? Um, and this is important because there are more types that don't contain values, right? They cannot be sort of instantiated, if you will. And, um, and one of them is the next one. There's one called apostrophe standard IO, which is a type now, which is of kind promise, right? So, I mean, it's barely visible, sort of this shift, right? So, a value becomes a type, uh, so this constructor becomes a type, and the type becomes a kind, 
Um, and so the only sort of syntactic um, way of ex you know sort of marking this distinction is putting this apostrophe in front. Uh, it's not actually required in most cases, um, but GHC now warns about when it's missing because I suppose it's a bit hard to follow if um, it's not there. Anyway, okay. So um, speeding up a little bit, uh, we have. Uh, so this is relevant to this explanation, this uh, definition of the pledge type. This is parameterized over stuff in promise in square brackets. This just means, of course, a list of promises. So the elements are lists um, written this way. They also get promoted to the to the to the kind level, right? So there's a kind where the where the types are lists. Right, and they're written like this. It's a little bit awkward because now the fact that we're constructing um, a list also has to have this apostrophe in front, and then we have another apostrophe right after, and then they can't be next to each other, so there has to be a space. Okay, it looks a little bit ugly, but anyway. Okay, so now, how do we use this? Um, the base system, the, the sort of the standard language standard actually defines this function called directory contents. For example, that just um, gives us a, a list of um, of the file names in the directory, right? Um, now we want to use that with with Haskell pledge. Now we have to say uh, we have to label it, right? We have to we have to uh, use our type system to label it with the promises that are needed. And uh, uh, we so reading the directory contents requires the R path. Um, promise. So hence, we just write this type signature, right? So we pass from you know, this type signature, where we take a file path and spit out IO of a list of file paths, to one where we take a file path and then we spit out pledge of ZS indexed over the R path promise yielding a list of file paths. Actually, so that's a type declaration. Underneath, it's very easy to define. We just apply the uh, pledge constructor. The constructor is this, right? Um, so they look the same, right? The, the name of the type and the constructor, that's very common to use the same name if, if there's only one. Um, uh, the constructor behaves like a function, of course. So it, in particular, it can be composed. Um, so the definition is, is very easy. Um, and then um, we have to define a new bind operator. Right, that can process all this information. Um, and uh, the type and type uh, signature is shown here. Uh, it's a little bit complicated, but essentially what this means is that, um, so we, we put in a thing, um, we put in a, uh, an action that requires cues, right? Um, and then we feed that into an action with a parameter that requires p's. And the result will be that the composite action requires p's and q's. Okay? Note that um, the, uh, the underlying value parameters have to agree, right? So the a here of the First value has to agree with the parameter of the of the second uh, argument of the bind operator, and then the result type here is the result type of the of the composite. Um, okay, and um, I won't have time to in explain in detail why this other parameter here is required. Um, I can show a tiny bit of code. Uh, and okay, I have to put the mic down for a second. So this is a slightly more elaborate example. Um, you can see we have an action that requires the standard I/O promise. Um, it's defined this way. Um, we define a main function that now has to have, uh, okay, let, let me, okay, let me talk about the do block first. Um, so 
we also have a, we have a do block here, um, and note there's an M in front of the do, and that means that's that's a way of telling GHC to use this new bind operator for sequencing these actions, right? So we have this. It looks slightly different graphically, but anyway, we have this uh, this sequence of actions. We get a line binded to a name, then we read the contents of the root directory. Um, we process the we process the uh, the file names that are returned in some way, and then we hand it off to another do block. And um, okay, so and the logic of this the logic of the sequencing makes it so that we must put these promises here at the top, right? And that, that's really the important bit, is that the, so once we've done, once we've done the sort of, the, the legwork of labeling, you know, the small parts, so the, the, the constituent actions, once we've, once we've labeled them with the promises that they need, um, we are forced to label all the composite actions accordingly, right? Or else the, the, the compiler will refuse to type check this. It's that simple. Um, we can also use wildcards to actually let the compiler tell us what we should put in this spot, right? So if we remove this and, and try to compile it, it would, it would give us a type error, and which would well, it might be a bit complicated, but it will essentially tell us what has to what has to go there, and that's based on the based on sort of synthesizing uh, this list according to the recipe that's defined by this new bind operator. Okay, um, that's that. Yeah, there's some caveats. I mentioned in the beginning that the GHC runtime has really good multi-threading support. It's quite sophisticated. This model will this implementation will not work. Um, the reason is that pledge applies to a process, right? And now if you have different threads in a process and they try to, you know, they can, so one thread could pledge, you know, a, a very small set of promises and, and another thread could, ex could try to do some action that actually requires some promise that was, was already relinquished, then of course you have a problem and, and your program will be terminated. So um, <clears throat> much more work is required to, to make this uh, uh, thread, thread safe. Um, we're not dealing with exec promises. That's the second parameter of the pledge call um, of, this, of the C function that uh, uh, I said I wouldn't say anything about. Um, um, some more work is required to make sure that we're not calling pledge sort of unnecessarily. So when we know, and in principle we know during compile time, when we're not actually relinquishing any, any extra promises, then we should be able to eliminate this pledge call. Also, this is com obviously completely non-portable because we're using uh, an OpenBSD-specific um, kernel API. Um, but there is actually a very cool project. So someone actually wrote basically a, a, an adaptation adapter layer for uh, that can translate pledge promises to seccomp um, programs. Uh, if that means anything to, to anyone. Um, and that would work on Linux. Um, I mean, there are probably lots of subtleties, but um, there's great potential to, to actually make this work on Linux as well. Uh, okay, so here's a, well, okay, you can't see the link. Um, uh, there's the Haskell.org webpage if you want to know anything about Haskell. Um, there's one paper, oops, okay, this is just stupid. There's one paper that I read that sort of it's really foundational for, for, for this sort of calculus, right? And it's, it's called, this, it's called the core calculus of dependency. Uh, I don't know, it's actually quite old. It's probably 80s or so. Anyway, so they provide a form of lambda calculus that can sort of track information at the type level. Um, and it has many of these, it has many relevant ideas there. Okay, that's it. Um, sorry, I, I might have gone slightly over time. Anyway, the QR code is my webpage, and there is a link to the project repo if you're interested in finding it. Thank you. <laughs> Questions?
programming language uh, and, and have them in your case. Did you find any cases where uh, code generated by Haskell has moved to some physical underneath that it's not your call uh, being done? I mean, internally you can do this type plan and you could launch a process and type the, the output to it and then that would be a fork or an exit or whatever. So, so do you have those things internally in Haskell also? And if you need to cater for it, it's never Yes, um, this is, uh, I mean, I have run into this. The GHC runtime system, it basically must have standard I.O. So I had to fudge it a little bit. So basically you always have standard I.O. Um, um, that's the only one I've run into so far. Um, the runtime system will not exec without you explicitly asking for it um, or fork. It will it will spawn threads. No, not even that. Okay, so you can lock it down. You can actually, well, obviously you can ask to the runtime system to run single thread, right? So then you're safe from that. Um, yeah, so there is potential for the runtime system to create problems here. And um, there could be others. I mean, there could be other snacks, of course, yeah. Okay, thanks.